Welcome to Red Eyes Radio. My name is Henrik Palmgren and this is Internet Talk Radio coming to you from Göteborg in Sweden at the uh, freezing top of the European continent. It's uh, good to have you all with us today. I hope you've uh, enjoyed uh, Samhain or Hallow's Eve or All Saints Day, whatever you're celebrating and uh, that you're comfortable wherever you are and uh, ready for another interesting radio program. If you're new to Red Eyes, either the website or this radio program, I suggest you go to our website and read more about what we do and uh, take a good look around. Check through our radio archive. We have a year of free radio programs up there for you. And we have a lot of material available in our member section as well. Video interviews, webcasts, films and over 400 hours of radio. And of course, don't forget to follow along in our busy news section as well. So again, you can find all information about this on our website, www.redicecreations.com. Okay, and today we are going to talk about some uh, biblical themes with the author and researcher Patrick Heron from Ireland. He's been uh, interested in Bible prophecy and the end times since about 96. He has uh, four books behind him. The most uh, recent one is called The Return of the Antichrist and the New World Order, and we're going to focus on this in our second hour today. But we're going to begin to talk about his uh, previous book, The Nephilim and the Pyramid of the Apocalypse, first. Uh, we've been uh, following the Nephilim theme uh, on and off almost since the inception of this program, so it's going to be interesting to return to this topic and hear uh, more about this today. Patrick's website, by the way, is uh, neph.ie, nef, short for Nephilim, nef.ie, where you can read more about his background and his books, of course. So with that, uh, welcome to Red Eyes Radio. Patrick, uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Henrik, it is absolutely wonderful to be with you here from Dublin in the Emerald Isle. And I would like to say hello to all your listeners out there in Internet Radio Land. And I have a question for you, Henrik. Yes. How come you Swedish people speak better English than we do? <laughs> well, I don't know if most do, but um, some might do. No, I don't know. Uh, the The dialect thing is absolutely interesting, but it sounds fine, and I think uh, our listeners today won't have any problem hearing what you're saying, Patrick. Well, I mean, uh, all the all the Swedish people I've met, they're usually blonde with with very attractive figures and nice. Uh, bosoms and stuff like that and they all seem to speak excellent english with a slight american twang i guess that's from watching american television i don't know i think it is too well i've got a sexy bosom so you know it's uh, all about that huh? yeah well <laughs> we, 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 we won't go there okay <laughs> okay that's that's for sure okay we'll really enjoy having you here patrick and i'm definitely looking forward to this program diving into some of these themes here that we mentioned here at the beginning of the program and just maybe to give a little bit of a background on, on you maybe you can just mention briefly for us how you kind of got into this subject and from there we can uh, of course dive into your book uh, uh, the, um, the Nephilim and the Pyramid of the Apocalypse. Well I'll tell you how I got into it. Um, basically I have been a Christian since 1976. To make a long story short uh, around 1973, 1974 I had long blonde hair Uh, I was into sex, drugs, rock and roll. I was in America as a student for three months in 73 and had a fantastic time there. Uh, I went back, um, you know, meeting lots of pretty American girls who thought my Irish accent was very sexy. So I, I really went, you know, made the full use of that. I went back in 74 and I traveled all around the States. I, I landed in Chicago, spent a few weeks there, hitchhiked back to Pennsylvania, drove down to Arizona. I lived out in the desert in Arizona for three weeks with uh, um, hippies who used to smuggle marijuana from Mexico to the East Coast. So I stayed with them for a few weeks. That was a very interesting situation there and did all sorts of funny things there. Then I hitchhiked up to Los Angeles where I met a friend of mine from Ireland who was becoming a Christian at the time. And me and him used to do all sorts of things together, including, you know, smoking pot and stuff like that. And, mm -hmm. you know, LSD a few times, not too much. I didn't do anything very heavy, but he was telling me about this and I thought he was nuts. And then a lot of very weird things happened to us when we traveled around California. And then we, I hitchhiked from California all the way back to Pennsylvania, which is right across the whole of America, which is about 5,000 kilometers or Three and three thousand miles in 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 old uh, old money, as it were. Mm. And uh, we met some people on the way. We got stuck in a very peculiar situation in the middle of California, where we were getting threatened by some rednecks who said they were going to beat us up, and it was getting dark. And I was scared stiff, but my friend just told me to keep, "Don't worry about it. Jesus will take care of us." Type thing. And I said, "Are you nuts?" So anyway, again, a, a guy picked us up on a motorbike, brought us home. 
he was a hippie who had become a Christian, and he gave me a Bible. And uh, when I came back to Ireland, I started reading it, and it meant nothing to me. And then in 1976, around springtime, I was reading one night, and I went up to the Gospel of Matthew. And remember, I was a hippie at this stage now, and, but I used to read a lot, and everybody in our house read a lot. And uh, I was 24 years old, and I said, okay, God, if you're there, show me something. It's supposed to be your word anyway. So as I read that night, uh, I started noticing things. I started noticing these references where Jesus would say something. It would refer back to the Old Testament, and I checked that out, and it was like a big jigsaw puzzle. So over the course of a few hours, the penny started to drop. I started to begin to see what this jigsaw about was about. And then sometime later, I had uh, an epiphany, or I saw the light, or I got born again, or I got saved, whatever you want to call it, like Saul on the road to Damascus. Hmm. And it tor- changed my life right around. I was up all that night. Uh, by, the, by the time one or two o'clock in the morning came, I was, I was down on my knees. Everything I read in the Bible was jumping off the page at me, you know, whereas, you know, prior to this, Jesus Christ was just a swear word to me. And I became a Christian. So again, long story short, I get into the, doing that for years. Around the mid-90s, I started reading about the prophecies, about the book of Revelation, the apocalypse, because I didn't know anything about them. And when I found out what these prophecies were about, I said I would like to make this available to ordinary people. So ordinary man in the street, Joe Soap, as it were, could understand what was written about these prophecies. So I wrote a, a very short book called Apocalypse Soon. Uh, I got on national radio in Ireland for an interview. The guy gave me a a fantastic interview. And at the end of it, he said, I read the book in one sitting and I was gripped. So the book went into the bestsellers in Ireland after that. That was okay. A year later, another publisher came to me and he he asked me to write another one. So I wrote another book on the same subject. It didn't do as well. It was, you know, slightly better book, but it it didn't do as well because they wouldn't let me on the national radio airwaves the second time. Then around 98, uh, 99, I was in Turkey with my wife and three beautiful daughters, and we were visiting some of the sites in Turkey. And by this stage, I started reading books like Fingerprints of the Gods and The Keeper of Genesis and Eric von Daniken, you know, Chariots yes. of the Gods, stuff like that, which I'd read when I was a teenager anyway. And we were down at a, t- at a temple in a place called Didyma in Turkey, and it was the Temple of Apollo. And it, it, it's broken down now, but they had pictures of it, of it as it was in, uh, when it was constructed originally. And outside this temple, Henrik, was um, these huge columns, like the columns you see in Greece on these temples. And there was 10 of them across and five deep. In other words, there was 50 of these columns, about 70 feet tall, which is about 100, or no, 70 feet, about, what, 30, 40 meters tall. Mm. Huge things mm. uh, um, in the front of this. And then the, the temple itself, of the Temple of Apollo, was made out of solid granite that you couldn't get a blade of a knife between the, the, the blocks. And I remember looking at this with my wife and my kids saying, there is no way that guys with hammers and chisels built this. And consequently, I, of course, I was, I was reading about the Great Pyramid of Giza and looking at the incredible mathematical stuff uh, and astronomical uh, knowledge uh, that is associated with, the, with this incredible building. I'll give you some of that in a moment. But when you get in and study it, you, you'll, you'll figure out that there's no way that human beings, that ordinary primitive man or prehistoric man could put this together uh, because it's just impossible. For instance, the Great Pyramid of Giza today, uh, architects and engineers freely admit that uh, there's no way we could build the Great Pyramid of Giza today with all the money we have, all the technology we have, all the machinery we have. We just couldn't do it. It's just beyond our reach. So for us to believe that ancient Egyptians or primitive man, if you will, wandering in the desert uh, somewhere between the Stone Age and the Bronze Age, dressed in animal skins, could construct this incredible pyramid. Yet somehow these same guys had not yet figured out how to invent the wheel. <laughs> it's like, hello? You know, it's, that's a bit like saying if you give a screwdriver to a chimpanzee, he's going to make a plasma TV set for you. It's just implausible. <laughs> so I knew there had to be another answer to this. It had to be some other uh, reason for, for who constructed these amazing buildings. Not just the Great Pyramid of 